well instead of wealth managing you or put a different way is the alternative to be poor does it mean when you are poor you are spiritual what's the place of prosperity in a believer's life so i'll pray for him so that he can he can start talking just before before for that lord i want to thank you for tony and that that he loves you i pray that you put what in his mouth so that we all who are listening can benefit in jesus name we pray amen, amen. thank you over to you tony amen wow thank you thank you so much uh just let me know if i'm audible uh, you are very audible. audible thank you first of all it's extremely extremely humbling uh i have to be one of those people definitely that you preached to skscf many years ago and here we are as your children coming back and fellowshipping with you and i think it's such a lovely lovely uh opportunity i felt uh so happy when i saw that it's you know kscf elders and people that have been leading evangelism in high schools and campuses for decades it is such such an amazing opportunity i am so so grateful and uh, my name is tony as um i had been introduced by um the elder and uh i have also benefited at one point from kscf way back in my high school years i do remember once or a couple of times a KCF had sent preachers to come and talk to us in high school and uh so uh, I am also a beneficiary of KCF ministries and what you people have been doing over the years and I'm so grateful and uh I just want to get right on to the message that and the topic that I had been assigned for the day and just getting to share uh, uh the topic of the day and I already love it but again I just feel like I can keep on saying thank you thank you so many times because of just how amazing it is to be here with all of you KSCF elders and the different people uh, uh Kinangop uh, <coughs> the evangelists from Kinangop I appreciate that so thank you so much uh just a small um uh, detail however just to let you know my voice is a bit hoarse I've been coughing a little bit so I might cough here and there just in case I need to alert you in good time but we're talking about prosperity and the place of prosperity in the believers life and what is that place of prosperity in the believers life now there is a set of um questions and issues that I'd been emailed earlier so as to guide the focus of what we'll be talking about in this session and I want to just begin by tackling the first issue that I uh, um uh, had been presented and just beginning by defining what exactly is true prosperity or what is prosperity because as believers you know this is one of the things that um is a subject that is very critical we understand properly and we also get to uh you know walk with god um uh, in the right manner even as it relates to prosperity and as i was thinking about prosperity there are two definitions uh, i was able to come up with of prosperity or how i would define prosperity right and i believe that we can look at prosperity in two ways uh from a scriptural point of view and the first way we can define prosperity is fulfilling god's plan and purpose for one's life fulfilling the plan and the purpose that god has over a person's life now you realize that this particular definition of prosperity doesn't actually carry a net what first comes to our minds when we think of prosperity because the first time we hear of prosperity what comes to our mind is the car the house the huge pieces of land and those are the things that we look at the material possessions and it's not entirely wrong but we need to put that in its proper place because the ultimate definition of prosperity and how the believer should look at prosperity and you know this definition is very critical because someone might ask well, why is it important that we define prosperity properly is because if you don't get the proper definition it means you'll be pursuing the wrong thing and there are believers that are pursuing the wrong thing in life because the definition of success and prosperity is not in accordance with what scripture and the word of god teaches us and so we have a lot of people that what they're going after or what they're calling success is really not success 
is how God determines it because it, it would behoove us as believers to want to understand prosperity not through our own lenses and understanding, but through God's lens and how God defines it. Because remember, the Bible says that at the end of it, you know, that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and that he shall evaluate our lives and he shall judge our lives and that our judgment, our verdict shall be rendered in accordance with how we lived our lives, you know. And when a judgment is being rendered, when you show up in a court of law, and I think I can use this example, I think it's, it, 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 uh, uh, there's this country, I'm forgetting its name, that where if you're caught uh, using drugs, and drug traffickers there are normally killed, it's Singapore. In Singapore, there's been a police will be killed. And when you get on the plane, it is there. You're, you're notified when you're visiting the country. Just even if you're a tourist, you're visiting the country of Singapore, you're notified. It's written there, death to traffickers. You know that. And so assuming you're coming from the United States, where in some states they've already legalized some drugs and it's okay to have certain amounts of those drugs. And you go over to Singapore with your measured amount of drugs and you're like, you know, this stuff is nice. And you begin to share with some people there and you get caught well, you're going to be sentenced to death because you're in Singapore and Singapore's laws are what apply. Now, why am I sharing this analogy? Is because we live life on our own terms, on our own rules and how we want and how we, you know, we, we feel is okay. Not realizing that on the final day, it is not our rules and standards that will be applied to judge our lives. It is not, you know, you can't say, you know, but you know, in, in USA, it's okay for me to have drugs. So the problem is you're not in the United States, you're in Singapore. And that's the thing, that how you live your life, on that final day, you will be judged and evaluated. And so what did you pursue? If you didn't properly understand what success and prosperity is, then you will go after the wrong thing. And when your life is being evaluated, you know, another portion of scripture, you know, Paul is talking about how that our works will be tested as through fire. And he says that some of us, our works will perish and that some of us will be saved through, through narrowly, will be narrowly saved. Why? Because everything we invested our our lives, our energy, and our time doing had no eternal significance. In the eyes of God, and based on God's grading system, whatever we did has no value, has no meaning. So then it is critical, it is very important that we understand things early enough so that we can apply ourselves in the right manner. It is good that we understand what exactly is success. You know, Joshua chapter number one, verse number eight is a very good portion of scripture. Well, you know, God is saying, this book of the law shall not depart from you, but you shall meditate upon it day and night. And then he says, and then you shall have good success. And there's something I would like us to pay attention to in that sentence that he says, then you shall have good success. Now, you know, that's a very interesting phrase. It's a very interesting thing to say good success. Why wouldn't that scripture have just said, then you shall have success? It's because there is good success and there is wrong success. In other words, there is a good kind of prosperity and success but there is also a type of success and prosperity that is not good. You know, it is not of God. It does not meet godly standards. It does not meet the criteria of what true success is. And what is good success? Because I want us to understand, first of all, what is prosperity? And then we begin to continue building up on that. What is prosperity? And what is this good success that Joshua chapter number one, verse number eight, is referring to saying, meditate upon this word. Think about the word of God. And then, and then, as a result of continual meditation on the word, continual, you know, thinking upon God's word, what happens is that then you will have good success, which means the word of God will lead and guide you into what is truly success in God's eyes. And so I look at success for the believer in two ways. Primarily, primarily success for the believer is fulfilling the plan of God. The plan that God has for your life, fulfilling that plan is a primary thing that we consider to be success. In other words, the metrics we use to measure success, you know, for weight, we've got kilos and grams, you know, for, 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 for distances, we've got meters and kilometers and centimeters. For true success, the metrics we use is a how much of God's plan are you fulfilling? And then closely connected to that. Now, this is a second thing that is tied to this. It is needed to do that. 
In other words, prosperity is fulfilling God's will and having the resources needed to fulfill that. Prosperity is fulfilling God's will and having the resources needed to fulfill that. In other words, that resource could be money. That resource could be a property. That resource could be the connections and the relationships, the social network that you need to fulfill the plan of God. That resource, you know, could be favor. That resource could be the faith you need to move the mountains and get over to the other side of the plan of God for your life. So when you're looking at success as a believer, you must think along the lines of what is the plan of God for me? And then now the acquisition of the resources that you need specifically to fulfill the plan of God. Now this is very crucial and very important and you'll see even how important it is as we continue on with this message, because there's a very good question that's going to come up along the line on how can we make sure that as believers, we pursue wealth and not miss God. Because sometimes in the pursuit of prosperity, some people turn away from God. You know, they they forsake God. They forsake the ways of God. And their pursuit of prosperity, as as Paul wonders in the book of 1 Timothy, and we'll be reading that scripture, where he says, you know, contentment and God, you know, godliness is great gain contentment and godliness is great gain. And it says that do not be like those who the love of money and the greed, the greed in many has led them into many troubles and many problems. And and specifically, the scripture is talking about the greed that has plunged many into all kinds of suffering. And so how do we make sure that as we are pursuing wealth, as you're seeking to grow well, then, you know, we're we're investing, we are going to real estate, we are are, are doing farming and agriculture, agribees, or we are, are, you know, we're seeking to grow our careers in the corporate and, you know, scaling our way up in business and all of that. How do we make sure that we don't lose it and that that, that we, we don't get lost in the money, how we make sure that we don't get get lost in the money is by making sure that what we are pursuing is true success, that we're not just pursuing wealth for the sake of it. We're not just pursuing the accumulation of property. We're not just pursuing the accumulation of more money in our bank accounts, but that this money has been given a purpose. This money has been given a greater purpose. So what is true prosperity? I look at it as fulfilling God's plan and having the resources needed to do so. You know, fulfilling the plan of God, as you can imagine, sometimes is a very expensive endeavor. You know, you need money for missions. You will need maybe vehicles. You will need, uh, you know, different things to be able to do that which God has called you to do. And the assignment that God has put in your life, it takes resources to do that. So prosperity, we can also look at it as having the resources you need to fulfill the plan of God, not just for your life, but even to support the work of God. You know, we need to support missions. We need to support one another. We need to support it. There's so much need in the society. You know, we've got so much need in our communities. We have orphans that need to be helped with their education. We have we have all kinds of needs, you know. We've got marginalized people that need help, you know. But there's all these needs that meeting the needs and helping bring change in our society, in our communities, is going to need resources. And so prosperity then is having the resources we need to accomplish this. But I want you to see here that the most crucial thing is the purpose, the purpose for the wealth, the purpose for the prosperity. And I need to keep emphasizing on this, and perhaps I will emphasize on this all the way to the end, because unless we the, the, the wealth that we are growing has a purpose to it, then we get lost in the selfish, greedy, lustful pursuit of, 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 of prosperity. In other words, our pursuit of prosperity as believers will be no different than that of an unbeliever out there. What differentiates the believer's pursuit of prosperity and the unbeliever's pursuit of wealth is the purpose and the motive of that pursuit. In other words, on the outward, it may look the same because on the outward, we are all going to work. On the outward, we are all working hard and definitely the Bible encourages us to work very hard. The Bible talks about diligence, you know, 
and that the hand of the diligent shall rule. And so there's something about diligence that leads to wealth. The Bible says that the field of the lazy man, you know, is overgrown with weeds. You know, it talks about the lazy man who says that there's a lion down, down the road. If I leave this house and start working, the lion will kill me. You know, the lazy man is full of excuses to not work. But what differentiates the believer and then unbeliever in their work. What makes it different? Because on the outside, we will look the same. On the outside, we are both in the office. On the outside, we are both investing. On the outside, we are both acquiring more property. We are both, uh, you know, doing business in, in the different things that we're doing. What differentiates the believer is a couple of things. One of those things is the purpose for which we are pursuing that well. What is the purpose? You must ask yourself this question. You must have those meetings with yourself where you ask yourself, why am I pursuing wealth? What's the reason? What's the motive? You know, sometimes our motives can even be very shallow, you know. You could be pursuing wealth because you want, you know, some people to see that you're rich. You know, you want people to look at you and see that you're very wealthy. Or maybe during the family get-togethers in, in, in Ushago, you know, you want to be seen, you're driving, you know, a, a, a four-wheel or something. Eh? So sometimes our, our motives are very shallow. So what is the motive? What's the purpose behind the work you're putting in, the energy, the effort you're putting in? What differentiates the believer <coughs> is a couple of things. The first thing is the purpose for our wealth. That's the first thing. The purpose for that wealth. The believer must look at prosperity and wealth as a gift given to him for him to steward for the sake of the advancement of the purposes and the plans of God. That's how the believer has to look at wealth. You must not look at it as something, you are not the center. In other words, you're not the center of what God gives you. You're not, you're not the center. The plan of God is at the heart of God's desire to prosper you. <clears throat> The advancement of his plan is at the center of his desire to advance you. God desires to advance you even materially for the sake of his plans and purposes. In other words, without the plan of God, wealth turns into materialism and greed and lust. That's, that's a major difference between being materialistic and being kingdom-minded. The, the difference between being kingdom-minded and being materialistic is an issue of purpose and motive. Because at the outside, we will both look like we're acquiring property and wealth and we are growing richer. But what differentiates the two of us between a materialistic believer and one that is kingdom-minded is the purpose for this wealth, the motive of this wealth, and what we do with what we have. That's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference. And so as we're talking about wealth, we have to understand, all right, that, 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 that wealth, true wealth, is fulfilling the plan of God and having the resources needed for you to do that. Having the resources needed to do that. And that's why the Bible talks about in Joshua chapter number one, verse number eight, like we read, it says that this book of the law, it shall not depart from you. In other words... <coughs> The word of God is to guide us in our pursuit of true wealth and prosperity. Why is it so? Because God's word will reveal to you the plan of God. God's word will reveal to you the intent, the heart of God, the purposes of God for your life, for your family, for your marriage, for your church, for the nation at large. The word of God is the mind of God. As we spend time in the word, we begin to have a revelation of the plan of God. As we spend time in the word, we begin to have a revelation of that which God desires to do. God's word gives us guidance. We are guided in this pursuit of wealth. So it is critical that as a believer, it is good that you, you spend time learning about money, gaining financial literacy, learning about the different uh, 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 tools of uh, growing your world and everything. But it is even more critical that you spend time with the written word of God. As you interact with it, the spirit of God will speak to you, will enlighten you, will lead you, will guide you into true wealth which is fulfilling God's plan and having those resources to fulfill that plan. So that's the definition of wealth. That's what wealth is. And you know, we can, we can build wealth, we can, we, can, we, can, we can acquire property, and we can, we can do these things in our own might, in our own wisdom, without God. But that's the dangerous thing about, you know, Psalms 127 gives us a very stern warning. Psalms 127 says, unless the, the, build, unless the, the Lord builds the house, the builders build in vain. Praise the Lord. 
unless the Lord builds the house. In other words, unless we, we, we are building our lives, we are building our wealth on the right foundation and with God in it, unless the Lord builds that house, the builders led by in vain. In other words, there are some of us that, you know, when we look at the, the, the natural metrics of wealth acquisition, it looks like we are growing wealth because you look at your account and it's been growing bigger and bigger. Last year, you had a couple millions, you've invested, you have some, some investment here, you've got some things in one account here, you know, you, you have some money, it's been growing, you know. And, and you look at that and, and you feel good. And it is, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. The fact that you're smart with your money and you know how to invest your money well and you're able to grow your money <coughs> is a great thing. And you look at that and you feel, well, you know, I'm doing great. You know, look at this. I just bought another property. I just bought another. And you feel great. You feel like you're doing amazing. And yet, in your acquisition of all this wealth, the plan of God is nowhere to be seen. The will of God is nowhere to be seen. Advancing the kingdom of God is nowhere to be seen. So by all natural standards, you seem to be doing okay. But if you judge yourself through God's word, you're far from okay. You, you, are, you are missing the mark when it comes to true prosperity. You're missing the mark by far. And like I told you, at the end of this life, the Bible says that it is appointed for every one of us to die. And to appear before God for judgment. At the end of it, when you appear before God, it will not matter how much money you made. I want you to realize that on that judgment day, as the Lord evaluates our lives, it will not be an God will not be evaluating your portfolio. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It is, it's not your portfolio. It's not your wealth portfolio that will be being evaluated that day. So you can build a very beautiful portfolio. But like he tells us in Psalms 127, unless the Lord builds the house, what does that mean? Unless we involve God, unless we make God the center of it, unless we make the plan and the purpose of God, the heart of it, we labor in vain. It shall all be in vain. And that's what the Bible is talking about in Corinthians, that, that all our works shall be tested as through fire. And as some of us, we shall lose everything because the Bible says, take heed how you build. For some are building with, 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 with wood, with hay, and others are building with precious materials. In other words, what's the materials here? The materials is the quality, the purpose, and the motive behind what you're doing. So this is take heed how you build. Let each builder, and you and I are builders. You're building our lives. You're building a family. You're raising kids. You're building a business. You're, you're, you're maybe a nation builder. You're building the country. You're involved in civic leadership. You're involved in... Uh, you, Oh, there's something we're building. All of us are builders. But this Bible says, let each one take heed to how they build. Because one builds with hay, another one builds with straw, another one builds with stone, others build with precious metals. What are you using to build? In other words, what is the purpose, what is the motive behind your pursuit of wealth? So then the next question, and as you can tell, these things are overlapping. So as I'm answering one, I'm by extension answering like, three, four more questions together. <clears throat> but I want us to look at, uh, at the next question here, a really good question. Can one be prosperous without money then? Can one be said to be prosperous without money? And as you can tell so far, yes, one can be so, said to be prosperous without money. Why? Because the primary index for measuring, <clears throat> measuring wealth for the believer is the plan of God. So then we cannot look at money and how much money you have. So money will be important in the equation of fulfilling God's plan for your life, definitely. That goes without saying, you know, at the very least, you need your rent paid. You need to eat so that you have the strength to go out and do something. So I, 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 even if it was just the bare minimum, you need some money for that. However, we cannot look at money and, the, and, and how much one has is the primary measurement. And you know, this is what believers get it wrong. You know, sometimes, you know, we look at the non-believers or we look at other people and they feel, you know, you know, I've been so faithful to God and why hasn't God prospered me as much as he has prospered another? You know, right there, that's, that's like a very revealing moment of your definition of prosperity. Because it could be that you have been fulfilling the plan of God for your life. It might not look like having millions in your bank account, but you're, you're fulfilling the plan of God for you. 
But you, you keep looking around and thinking, well, you know, I don't have the biggest house in the country. You know, I, I'm still renting. I'm, I'm, I don't have millions in my in my in my uh, in my in my bank account in my savings. I don't have a lot of land, and and you feel like you know maybe God has failed me. God has not God has not been faithful to me, and that's a challenge. That's a problem. But sometimes the call of God for you might not look necessarily like you being the richest person. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It might not look like that. I, I told you a bit earlier, I do have a bit of a cough, but the Lord is with us. <clears throat> it might not look like that. So you can look at, you know, I don't have a lot of millions and say, well, I'm not prosperous. God hasn't been faithful. And the sad thing, and you know, it, it's good this is a missionaries meeting because one of the sad things that's happening nowadays is nobody wants to say yes to the call for missions. And when they are called for missions, <coughs> everybody is being called for missions in the United States or in UK. Everybody will be praying and come and say, you know, as I was praying, you know, I just began to see a vision and I was just seeing the flag of, I was just seeing the flag of Canada. <laughs> no, nobody sees Somalia. <coughs> no, <laughs> nobody ever sees the flag of, don't, don't Somalis need the gospel? I mean, everybody will pray that, you know, I, you know, as, as I, I was just, you know, praying and, and fasting and seeking the Lord at the mountain. And, you know, I, I just kept just kept hearing the spirit of God saying, you know, and, and, and showing me California. California has too many preachers. Why is nobody hearing God for Mozambique, for Somalia, for Djibouti, for Eritrea? Everybody is only hearing God for the more affluent places. Something is wrong about our priorities. I mean, if we judge prosperity by, by those metrics, then we should conclude Paul is a failure. Yeah, Paul, Paul would be a complete failure in today's society. Because when you look at uh, Paul's portfolio, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite a way to put it, but if you look at Paul's portfolio, you know, the, the portfolio Paul had was that he had been shipwrecked, he had been beaten from city to city, he had been persecuted by Gentiles, persecuted by Jews. That's, that's quite a portfolio for someone to have. That doesn't look like prosperity. But till today, we are reading the books of Paul. The entire Gentile church, all of us who are non Jews, we are built on the foundation of the work and the ministry of Paul. Shall we conclude that then he was a failure because Paul was not the richest man in his time? By no means. Because the plan of God is different for each individual, and prosperity must be judged using that plan as a, as a standard of measurement. That is what we have to look at. What is the plan of God for your life and how much of that plan are you fulfilling? That's a question you have to ask yourself. How much of that plan are you fulfilling? And so the believer has to endeavor then to fulfill that plan. So I, I believe that, that that sheds some light to that because there's a question of can one be prosperous without money? Yes, one can be. One can be. We have to look at it in a very holistic sense. You know, In the book of Luke chapter number 12, <coughs> verse number 15, you know, Jesus saying that, that life is, does not consist in the, in, the, in, the, in the accumulation of material wealth. Life does not consist in those things. It doesn't consist in those things. Praise the Lord. It, it doesn't consist in those things. So what then? What then is, is, is God's attitude or disposition? What's, what's his desire for the believer in regards to wealth? Well, this is what I believe. Bottom line is God delights in our prosperity. He delights in our prosperity. But then we understand what I mean when I say prosperity. He delights in our prosperity. He delights that we should have all we need for life and godliness, to fulfill his will and to bless those around us. So he, he delights. It is his pleasure. You know, there's a verse that says that God delights in the prosperity of his servant. He delights in the prosperity of his servant. All right. It is now up to us as a servant of God to make sure that we are aligned with the plan and purposes of God. Because our pursuit of wealth, unless it is aligned with, 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 the, with the core thing being the pursuit of the fulfillment of the plan of God, we will miss the mark. So what will act as a true north? What's going to act like a beacon? You know, the way those, those beacons in the ocean, uh, you know, they, they, they have a beacon that, that lights up and acts to, to guide the, 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 the ship captains. They can tell the direction they need to head towards. <clears throat> or a true north, what do you call a true north? It shows you, you know, the direction. 
It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bearing point. What, what is to be a true north? To keep us from the pitfalls. And what are the pitfalls? What are the pitfalls? Because unless you have this true north proper, uh, a lot of pitfalls will take us out. <coughs> and what are those pitfalls? One of those pitfalls is greed and lust. That's an obvious one, greed and lust. When, when, when greed eats up your soul and takes up your heart. And how do you know greed has taken over your life? Is when, 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 the, most, when the, the thing that matters the most to you is money. You will choose money over, over people. You will choose money over your wife. You will choose money over your spouse. You will choose money over your children. When it gets to that level, that's greed. When it gets to the level that you will, you will compromise your values for money, you will lie, you will, you will sleep around, fornicate, do all kinds of you know, shoddy things for money. That's when you know greed has taken over your life. When, when you're willing to go against the ways of God to try and get money, that, that is what greed looks like. Greed works when once, once you're compromised, you know greed is driving you. So greed and lust. That last, the, the excessive obsession of, of acquiring with, and for no other reason than just self-aggrandizement. Why are you for just for status and, and for a sense of recognition? That there's no there's there's no other no nobler purpose to, to your pursuit of wealth than that. that. That's 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 a pitfall, very dangerous for the believer to fall in. The pitfall of greed, the pitfall of materialism, as we've talked about it. Materialism being, you know, where the primary focus and pursuit of life is just material gain and prosperity and nothing more. Another one, very critical, let me tell you, this is dangerous, is self-reliance. You know, the Bible warns, and the Bible warns in the book of James, they just tell the rich people to not put their confidence in their wealth. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Tell the rich. Do not put their confidence. Why? Because there's something about money that makes you self-reliance and you stop caring about God. <clears throat> you know, before you, you had a lot of money, you will seek God. You will obey God. You will pray. You will fast. You know, you, you will go to church. You will listen to your pastor. You will listen to your leaders. A bit of money starts coming in and that's it. You know, <laughs> you know it flips. You know, nowadays you're the one who normally calls to check up on the church and the pastor. You, you, don't, you don't go to church. You call the pastors, uh, Pasi, Mkosawa. You're doing fine. The church is okay. It is you now who is checking up on the whole church. And the, you don't need help. You don't need to be checked upon. A, you're, you're now self-reliant. Nobody can correct. And this, this, is, this is one of the most dangerous pitfalls that we fall in as believers. Because when, when you get to this place where you realize you're getting some money and and you're starting to get proud, it tells you that your confidence is in what you have. And these are bad pitfalls because the Bible says pride comes before fall. I tell you, in other words, in the equation of falling, what comes before is, is pride. Once pride shows up, eh, we know what's coming next. <coughs> it's just how it works. Once pride shows up, the next thing is a fall. <coughs> Self-reliance. Another pitfall to avoid is dishonor towards God. Dishonor towards God. I tell you, you know, I, I'm reminded of the case of Saul. When God called Saul, that time he looked at himself as a very lowly man, and God calls him to be king. And there's a time where he's no longer paying attention to God. He's now not listening to the prophet Samuel. He's not caring about the ways of God. He's not, he's not even concerned about that. God gives him very clear instructions. He goes and disobeys. And one time God is asking him, hmm, when I called you, were you not little in your own eyes? What changed? And, and King Solomon was being called. He was little in his own eyes. And we must endeavor to remain little in our own eyes. You must always remain little in your own eyes. And, and God is asking King Saul, were you not little in your own eyes when I called you? Now that I've made you king, you can't even listen to what I've got to tell you. And that's the danger of acquiring material wealth. These are some people can pay attention when they don't have anything, but as soon as the millions begin to come in, they no longer care what the word of God says. Hayuko. 
kanisa na kujaa masaa anataka siku hizi ameanza ku complain unajua hizi ibada ni ndefu you know hii service inafai kwake kama wane na half hours you know life is busy we, we have business <laughs> yeah, praise the lord ya amekuwa busy all of a sudden unajua <coughs> i have important business to do you know you can keep me in charge at nimekuwa hapa kutoka saa 3 saa 4 saa 8 you know what what is this you know i'm, I'm a busy man <laughs> hmm? dishonor towards god once some money comes in you become busy even on your idol you're busy any day you're busy people call you you're busy dishonor towards god these are pitfalls that come to people and why do these pitfall, pitfalls uh, 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 come to people is because their value system was wrong <coughs> they did not understand prosperity as we are defining it here they did not understand that prosperity has to do with the plan of god they thought prosperity is just the acquisition of material gain but when you understand that how god will judge you and it is good that you hold that in mind that you will be judged on the final day it is a good thing to keep in mind it's good to keep that in mind because it keeps you with a holy fear of god in the bible says the fear of god is the beginning of wisdom it, it keeps you with a certain holy fear you know you conduct yourself more responsibly you know that's why david said teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom you know there's a recklessness you will not have when you know god will judge you finally there's a way you won't be spending your resources anyhow there's a way you won't be careless there's a way you won't be careless with your time with your money with your relationships with the opportunities god gives you why because you know on the final day you shall give an account of what you did with those things God shall evaluate your life based on his standards. Remember the example I shared with you in Singapore, traffickers get a death sentence. <coughs> It's a, even if you're a stranger, you visited as a tourist and and you're caught with drugs, is death to traffickers. But you know you can begin to say oh but you know I'm not a Singaporean. <coughs> I'm from the states and there we were told that we can use this drug. The only unfortunate thing is that you're not in the United States you're in Singapore and Singapore laws are what apply. Let me tell you. You can live life on your own laws. <coughs> you can decide I'll live life how I want. I'll spend money how I want. I'll do things the way. The problem however is on the final day it is not your laws and constitutions that will judge you. It's not what is going to be used. It is God's word. And he started so it 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 would be wiser then it would be wiser as you can tell that we understand the standards of God right now so that we begin to prepare so that on that final day we are ready uh, you know we need to think about that so that on that day we are ready i'm talking about pitfalls why do people fall in these pitfalls is because they were the foundation was wrong the foundation was materialism the foundation was lust and because the foundation was lust the love of the world that the bible warns us in first john chapter number 2 it says do not love the world or the things it for these things shall pass away but he that does the will of god shall abide forever that's first john chapter 2 says do not love the world for the world and all that is in it shall pass in other words as live your life based on the eternal principles as a, of, of of god <clears throat> because everything else is temporal The Bible says the flowers, you know, will the grass will wither, the flowers will fade. But the word of God it endures forever, and them that live by that word shall endure forever. Them that do the word shall endure forever. So as we are, as, as as we are seeking prosperity because it is in order to pursue it, it's it's not wrong in and of itself to pursue prosperity. What makes it wrong is what is the motive. That's the main question. What's the foundation? What's the foundation? And that's what I said on the outside it may look the same like we are all pursuing uh, uh, wealth and prosperity and it may look the same on the outside but there's a there's a, there's a differentiator. There's something that sets us apart as believers, kingdom minded individuals that fear God. And what is it that sets us apart? What are those? The first thing we said is the purpose of the world, the motive for that wealth. Another one very crucial, it's good to mention this, is how you grow that wealth. How you grow that wealth. It cannot be for you as a godly believer, it cannot be through lying and corruption and all kinds of uh, ungodly manners. How we will build our wealth is by godliness. 
Yes. The Bible says it's better off to eat a tiny piece of bread, you know, and be poor but have integrity than to, to be in a rich man's house who is full of corruption. So you also have to build with systems of integrity. You must not be corrupted so that you don't fall into these pitfalls. But how do we avoid these pitfalls? Is having the right foundation. What is the right foundation? And this is a point I'm going to begin to uh, uh, wind, wind this up. I can tell I've covered probably almost every question as I was speaking. But what's the right foundation? And I want us to finish up on this. What's the right foundation? The right foundation is this. The love of God and the fear of God. Those two. Those two. So that then, <clears throat> as you are increasing, and you're going higher and higher, it doesn't get colder for us. We are not growing in wealth and losing on our fire for Christ. We're not growing in wealth and losing on the fire for evangelism and missions. We are not growing in wealth and losing on the fire for prayer. But how do we make sure how do we pursue this world in a balanced way so that, so, so that we, we, we are growing in a holistic sense? We are growing in our faith. We are growing in, our, in, 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 in wealth. We, we are growing in relationships. We are growing in our marriage. We are growing in our family. We are growing in our parenting. How do we pursue wealth in a holistic way? The answer is the foundation. What foundation have you built your life upon? What foundation are you building upon? The foundation needs to be these two things, the love of God and the fear of God. We must not love the world. We must not be in love with the world. We must fall in love with Jesus every day. Not just that, but we must fear God. You know, there are people who know the love of God, but don't know the fear of God. And how you tell the difference is that some people don't care when they're disobeying God. And you know what they'll say? Well, you know, but God loves me. You know, God is full of grace. And, and, and that's, that's their mantra for wickedness and rebellion. Their, their mantra for disobeying. You know, just before they disobey, they remember the grace of God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Just before they disobey. They <laughs> just before they disobey, they, they, they remember the grace of God. And say it is by the masses of God that I am not consumed, and they still. Hmm? No fear of God whatsoever. We must fear God. And it was to fear the Lord is to depart from evil. To depart from evil in all its forms and appearances. To avoid evil in all its forms and appearances. That's what the fear of the Lord is. Unless our lives are built on the foundation of the love of God, and the fear of God, we will miss it. We may start out okay, but we're going to drift. You know, I loved something that the woman of God mentioned as we began. Drifting. You know, drifting does not happen immediately. You know, when, you, when you're on a boat in, in, on the sea or even, even on a wide river, <clears throat> the waves hitting that boat can be so tiny. The, the, the fossil, it's the very tiny waves, huh? Just it's almost so that the motor is just moving smoothly but hitting you small, you know, bit by bit. And you deviate a little bit. <clears throat> you deviate by very tiny, let's say even 0 0.5 degrees from the actual direction. But what happens? That continual deviation. So tiny, and, and the, the problem is it is so tiny that you can't tell when you're deviating. It is much later when you now look up that you realize I was headed over there. And I'm this way. Why? Because over time, you headed in the wrong direction. You know, it... even being, that's even a lot, even by 1.5 degrees. And then you give it time. It continues, of course, by 1.5. Over a period of, let's assume, a couple of hours, that ship is headed for another country. It's not even going there. It's, that's a whole, not even a different location. That's a different country it's going to. And that's how deviation happens. It's, that's, that's what we call drifting away. <clears throat> we must consistently. This is why John the Apostle, I believe in the, in the second letter, <clears throat> Apostle John in the book of the, is writing to his children, is telling them, take heed that you do not lose your reward. You know, take heed. 
take heed. In other words, it's, you must be cautious. You must be careful that you don't drift away. Praise the Lord. How are we going to be careful so that we don't drift away? I'll tell you how. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is how we shall not drift away. Unless we invest in the fear of the Lord, I tell you, we shall drift away. We shall drift away and we shall miss the mark. The love of this world shall lead us astray. Build your life on the foundation of the fear of God and the love of God. <coughs> as you pursue wealth, as you pursue the increase, because God does want to increase you. You know, it's not the, the, the plan of God for you to not have your rent paid, for you to not have money to give to, towards, you know, maybe your church and missions, help your family, help your relatives. That, that's, that's not the plan of God. But our hearts must be right. Our priorities must be right. Uh, we, we must be built on the right foundation so that we pursue this world in a holistic and in a balanced way. And that's what keeps us safe. That's what keeps us from, you know, drifting away as the money comes, drifting away as God begins to prosper us and to advance us. That's what keeps us in that place where we can increase and we can grow in wealth. And finally, let me make, make mention of this and open it up for any questions that anybody has. Is just want to talk about Quickly, how God prospers us. How does God prosper us then if it is with? Very quickly, the first way God prospers the believer is through work. Work. Yeah, the Bible says the hand of the diligent shall rule, shall have dominion. Work. The next avenue, the next tool God uses to prosper you is strategic relationships. God will bring strategic relationships in your life that, that, that will open up a whole world of opportunities for you. Right, the, that thing very important is divine guidance. The Lord will speak to you, He will guide you, He will give you ideas, He will lead you in business, He will lead you in investing. Divine guidance, and finally, and this is the one that most of us love, but I put it as a last one is supernatural provision, miracles. God also performs miracles. So, I want to believe in those few minutes about 40 minutes or thereabout, we have spoken about prosperity, what prosperity is, and how the believer practice prosperity. So let me put it back to Elder John to continue on from there. And if there are questions to, to, to Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brother Tony, uh, for that uh, topic. Uh, you covered it quite well. And just like you said, you were responding to questions that had been raised. But I want to believe that uh, there are questions and I will request uh, that we can use the chat or you can raise up your hand as we give him uh, two minutes to take some water. I would also give a chance for people to react. Uh, meanwhile, as we wait for questions in the chat or even raising a hand. I don't know where James is. Uh, I would like to request the James. You are, I would have given you a chance to pray. But I want to give you a chance to react to uh, Tony's uh, uh, sharing. Meanwhile, as I give uh, those who are in attendance an opportunity to write their questions or even raise up hands. Otherwise, uh, uh, each one of us uh, speaks what we have picked. We can be able to repack it. And uh, if there are gaps that you feel that you want to be responded to, Possibly the practical part from your sign. It was reminding me of a song that we have been trashing, Bolina Ngobe Trifata, which that used to be sung. Uh, I want somebody to comment on that because uh, that one has been said in the pulpit, but I tend to think that sometimes we need to know why uh, people were singing those songs, uh, they were spiritual also. And of course, there is also the way. People feel that possibly if I am a chairman, I shouldn't be like this, or I'm a pastor, I should be like this. It's, it's like we set the standard and then we want everybody to come along and help us uh, to meet those standards. So I think I opened the floor uh, for response and questions. I think one of the challenges that we've had in, um, I would say there are two potential pitfalls that as believers we can fall in. The first pitfall on one side is materialism, greed, and lust, where we pursue wealth out of greed and lust. And the second one on the other side is where we treat wealth like it's not important. You know, we don't need it as long as we are born again. 
uh, there's no need for me to grow wealth, there's no need for me to work very hard, you know, this money doesn't matter. And that's also a very dangerous approach because the work of God itself needs money, family needs money, marriage needs money, children need money, helping our neighbors, neighbors need money. So what, what we need to do is have the right motive in our pursuit of money, but we definitely should work very hard in what we do to increase and to grow our wealth. You know, the Bible even praises the Proverbs 31 woman. One of the things you realize about the Proverbs 31 woman is that she's an entrepreneur. The Bible talks about how she bought things and sold things and did business and bought properties. And so we see that what is actually being praised of the uh, Proverbs 31 woman is her business mindedness and her ability to grow wealth and, and become prosperous. That is what is actually being praised in Proverbs 31. Uh, so, so we need to definitely pursue uh, prosperity and wealth, but what we need to be careful about is what is the foundation upon which our lives are built on and what is the purpose and the motive with which you are pursuing wealth. I wouldn't say that Borinang uh, Obe, uh, you know, has it tajiki. Thank you. Uh, Muturi, Joseph Muturi, uh, seeing you are in the queue, you can raise your question, please. Uh, thank you so much, Elder John. And this is my question. Uh, it, uh, it comes actually from the point that you have made, actually from one of the questions, where it was saying that the higher you go, the cooler it becomes spiritually. So Tony has talked about one of the ways that God prospers a person. Number one is through work. So my question is like this. Uh, what if you are very much occupied with your work and responsibility? More so, uh, maybe God has called you to a place where you are so busy. And then, and responsibilities are so many. And you no longer used to pray how you used to pray. Uh, the hours that you used to give and devote yourself to the Lord, you like minimize them because of the responsibility and because of your work. Does it mean that you're drifting away from God or does it mean that your fire is going down? Thank you. Oh, that's, that's an excellent question and a very understandable one. Um, I guess what I would say is this, life has different stages and in each stage of life, your priorities will be different. Your the amount of time you have that's free will be different. Uh, and uh, if you take the example of um, campus students, for example, is that when in campus mostly, you have uh, usually you can get a lot of time, uh, sometimes even entire days to pray, read the Bible. But sometimes as you uh, uh, now go on with life, you get unemployment, assuming it's a eight to five job. You start a family. Those responsibilities are growing and they're making a greater demand on your time. So then it becomes a, a question of uh, uh, now where well, you have to truly prioritize, being very intentional. I think now in such a stage, you have to be more deliberate and intentional that, than you were before. You know, earlier it may have been automatic because you had the time. But now you have to be now very intentional to now create that time. So whether it's waking up earlier, uh, having maybe uh, uh, some time set apart during the week, so it may not be to the same measure of time and understandably so I can look at that as being your drifting away from God because uh, it, it's that the life is making greater demands you know um, one who is free who is single and uh, doesn't have a very demanding job has more time than a man who has uh, several children a wife and, uh, and a very demanding job and other responsibilities or certain responsibilities. Their, their, their freedom is very different, huh? but uh, at every stage in life, what you need to do is to be very deliberate with uh, prioritizing your time with God and uh, uh, making sure that you're guarding that time and that moment with the Lord. So it may not always be five hours every day, as maybe it may have been in some seasons of your life, but making sure that there's a constant devotion and fellowship with God. Even if it's an hour or 30 minutes every morning, every day, what really helps is the consistency of it, being very consistent to con and creating the time in the different transitions of life. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
who else has a questions or a comment, a reaction? I'm giving you a chance. You can lift up your hand, and then I'll give you an opportunity. I don't know whether silence means the uh, uh, Tony responded to all your questions. Uh, I'm still giving a chance before I point particular people here to uh, to give their reactions as we draw near to the close. We have some few minutes. I, I know this, uh, there was a topic that was being covered through uh, our visitation that is Christian view of success. Uh, last Tuesday, we also had a speaker speaking on identity, and today, Brother Tony has also spoken on principle of prosperity. But I tend to see those all those tied up together because you cannot talk of success, you fail to talk about prosperity, you cannot talk of identity without also uh, being looked at from that point of angle. And I thank God for that uh, with all that, we have to find the praise of uh, ourselves as Christians uh, in terms of prosperity. Because prosperity gospel, we know at, uh, at uh, this particular time is uh, it's actually destroying. I would say it's also destroying and also making people move out of the way. And I think hearing it and, of course, repackaging it for, uh, for the student uh, in our school so that they can also be able to understand because we, what i see as we visit is uh, them adopting some of those uh, traditions and cultures that are taking place in the the, the main the the, the the churches wherever they go and when we go there of course we are trying to help them uh, be able to repair upon gone but i i would like to say that there uh, this one thing that we that have come out very uh, strongly fulfilling God's plan and purpose and for all the resources that you need God has those resources because we start from him we'll go back to him and we just have to do his work he teaches us he gives us the opportunity and then he also helps us to do those uh, work I've been reading the book of Judges and um, the character I am on is Samson Samson came as a result of God's uh, plan but I was surprised that uh, in as much as he did help the children of Israel, he pursued. Uh, it's like he was pursuing his own vision, his own desires. And of course, I believe instead of the 20 years that uh, he helped, he could have possibly helped much longer. And of course, we don't remember him with a very good uh, uh, life. In the same case, as you have said, the higher you go, the cooler to become. Uh, it's very easy for us now to acquire prosperity and we fail to use it uh, thinking that we just acquired it for our own good and not uh, for God's work. Anyone? Anybody else? Uh, I still have six minutes. Elder John. Is he with us? Elder John. Nganga. Yes, Sema. I wanted your reaction. It's like people don't have questions uh, before well, we... just finish the meeting. If they have not got questions, yeah, just allow them to go. Okay. Sawa. Mm. Yeah, Rebecca? No, I'm saying I don't have a matter, so... Yeah. <laughs> so... So I want to welcome uh, James. James, please uh, appreciate our speaker for today. And please also give us uh, a closing prayer. I know Adrian has uh, been recording, so I believe just like we do in other meetings, they'll be able to share this uh, in our forums and, of course, also in the website. For those who are joining, possibly because of uh, Tony's uh, Karani's uh, Rink, uh, Kit has a website. You can be able to check on it. I think, uh, James, you can say more about it and find all the trainings that have taken place over time. 
And that can also be another source of uh, material that can help you. Otherwise, uh, thank you for being patient and for being there. I believe that we have been equipped in one way or another. Otherwise, God bless you and have a blessed week. James. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, for Tony, we are so grateful even uh, for what you have done, uh, just uh, preparing and, um, and, 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 and taking us through this. One of the things that I picked and uh, ran with, uh, will run with, is, uh, is uh, the linkage between uh, prosperity and God's purpose and the resources. And you said <laughs> uh, having the resources to, achieve, you know, to fulfill um, the purposes uh, God has for, for you. And I think that uh, is very, very important. Um, j- just uh, linking that with purposes of God, God's will, it's not about ourselves. It is not about our comparing ourselves with our siblings um, or, you know, cousins in uh, family meetings when uh, which car you're driving or what title you go by and that kind of thing. I think that for me is profound. And uh, Tony, may the Lord bless you and keep prospering you uh, so that uh, you can help uh, many other people. Uh, we appreciate the fact <laughs> that uh, that uh, you have many followers. <laughs> you just, uh, you know, people look at your status and they just want to follow you. I think uh, you are a person of influence. And may the Lord help you even to continue influencing um, young people in the right direction. i uh, just giving you what it takes to to help young people um, even uh, get to understand God's will and purposes of their lives. Asante sana, ubarikiwe. And for the rest of us, thanks for joining in and uh, just uh, showing up. Um, these trainings have made me what I am. Have given me a lot of resources um, to be useful in the community, in our local church, and of course, uh, um, serving the students um, or working with the students in high school. So thank you very much for everybody. The resource, I, uh, Tony, I think uh, you had John mentioned something that um, we expect uh, s- some material, and one of the things is that uh, this is being recorded, and it will be. It, 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 it will be on the our YouTube channel, um, KSCF Kit. At the same time, uh, the material will be posted or will be uploaded in our website, kscfkit.org. But somebody can correct me if I made a mistake with the URL. So thank you very much. God bless you. Shall we pray? Lord, we are so grateful uh, so much because... Um, because you are speaking to our hearts. You are speaking to us again and again about um, using our resources to serve you, to serve the purposes for which you um, you created each one of us. How I pray that, Lord, we shall be faithful to do that, O oh God, in Jesus' name. I pray that whatever you put in our hands, O oh God, we shall not be seeing it as ours, but we shall be seeing it as um, uh, yours, that, uh, that that it belongs to our God, our Father in heaven, who wants us to be involved even in his agenda. We thank you, Lord, and we exalt you. We pray that you may continue speaking to our hearts, you may continue training us the way that we should go. In the name of Jesus, you shall continue helping us, Lord, even now. Um, just to, just to, um, to be what you created us to be. We thank you, Lord, and we honor you. We commit ourselves, even our missions to you, high school missions. Sometimes it is difficult, but I pray that you may help us. Uh, even those who without jobs, there are many who are yearning to go. And sometimes do not even have fear. I pray that, Lord, you may open opportunities for them and give us the right word even to share with the high schoolers and uh, those other people you place even at our feet. We thank you, Lord, and we exalt you. Watch over all of us and continue blessing us, even with good health, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We shall enter the words of the faith. 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.